This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. An International Human Rights Commission has arrived in Colombia to investigate the country's brutal crackdown on protesters following a general strike in April and weeks of massive mobilizations against the right-wing government of President Ivan Duque. Since the protests began, over 80 people have died, many at the hands of police and paramilitary forces. This is Astrid Torres, one of the organizers of the International Commission. She's a member of the Corporation for Judicial Freedom, based in the city of Medellin. The purpose of the international mission taking place in Colombia right now is to be able to create a call for attention at the international level about the serious situation that the country has been suffering due to the institutional violence that the national police have unleashed towards protesters in Colombia for more than 64 days now, since the national strike. Many of the Colombian protesters in the streets have been young people who've lost their jobs or who couldn't afford to continue their education because their families have been deeply impacted by the economic crisis in Colombia, triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic. This is Father Javier Giraldo, a Jesuit priest and veteran human rights defender in Colombia. Pues, digamos el this sector of young people who are in the barricades, in the streets, they have been greatly victimized by Colombia's economic model. This is a sector that recognizes itself as a group that doesn't have a future. What they constantly denounce is that they don't have anything else to lose if they're killed. We go now to Bogota, Colombia, where we're joined by Mario Murillo, an award-winning journalist and professor at Hofstra University in Long Island, New York. He's in Colombia reporting on the International Commission. He's closely followed Colombia for decades. His books include Colombia and the United States, War on rest and destabilization. Mario, thanks so much for joining us. Um, can you talk about the significance of the April uprising and the deadly crackdown by Ivan Duque? Well, thank you, Amy, for having us. Uh, I think uh, the significance of the uprising and the crackdown is that it's a continuation of a process that's been going on pretty much since 2016, when the peace accords between the FARC guerrillas and the government of Juan Manuel Santos was signed, and the right wing did everything in its power, through its media, through its um, politics, through its discourse, to, de to completely derail that peace process. And notwithstanding the problems and the many flaws in the accords that were signed, there were some efforts to uh, make some steps forward uh, in terms of political participation, in terms of land reform, in terms of substitution of uh, coca in the countryside for poor peasant farmers, a range of things that essentially have been derailed completely by the, by the uh, uh, first, the right-wing government before they took power in 2018, and then Ivan Duque, the current president. And so what we've seen since that moment has been a systematic elimination of the popular forces, the popular sectors throughout the country that have been trying to push for some of the measures to be implemented from the peace accord, environmental activists, human rights workers uh, about participation and political participation, uh, indigenous movements, Afro-Colombian movements. You had a segment on uh, Berta Cáceres in, in, in Honduras, just to, to, stop, to start the show this morning. Um, we have about 1,100 Berta Cáceres in Colombia since 2016, social movement leaders at the base who have been targeted by a dirty war of, of elimination, of, of, of uh, um, genocide, we can call it. And in fact, some of the members of the commission, uh, the organizers of the commission, are, are not refraining from using that term. Uh, at the same time, you have, so you have this elimination, but you also have a situation where the situation economically, socially, has been getting worse ever since 2016, partially because of the economic model that was never part of the negotiation, partially because of the, um, uh, 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 the COVID crisis, which I think was the explosion that led to the final explosion, but that you've, you've seen people basically from every different sector of, the, of Colombian society, uh, uh, students, uh, women's groups, uh, LGBTQ movement, Afro-Colombian sector, the indigenous movement, uh, basically seeing that their place in Colombian society is being more and more marginalized as the rich get richer and they get more targeted. And there's been, there have been protests going on for a long time now, since 2016, different sectors. But what we see now in the uprising that started on, on, on April 28th 
and that in many ways continues, is uh, a, a multi-sector explosion where the people are saying enough is enough. And, you, and you're seeing frontline activists, young activists, who are basically saying, nosotros no tenemos futuros. We do not have a future. We have nothing to lose. Even our lives, we're willing to uh, uh, sacrifice our lives to put a change to the situation in Colombia. So those are the two kind of strains that are happening here. Uh, Mario, I wanted to ask you, uh, there's been a, a lot of stuff happened last week that did uh, in uh, Colombia and South America that didn't get uh, much coverage. Uh, the CIA director, William Burns, uh, visited uh, Colombia, uh, as well as uh, uh, President Bolsonaro in Brazil. Uh, President Biden had a phone conversation uh, with uh, Ivan Duque, and Duque himself supposedly was the, the target of, uh, of an assassination attempt or people firing on his helicopter. Could you talk about the U.S. military role uh, in uh, in uh uh, in Colombia, especially given the fact that Colombia has such an extensive border with Venezuela. Well, that's a good point. I mean, first of all, yeah, you're right. Those those events happened, and they kind of didn't get a blip on the radar screen in terms of U.S. media. And I think it's important to talk about U.S. policy because it's pretty much been consistent for the last 60 years or so, maybe even more, go, going way back to the 1940s. The destabilization initiatives to target the social movements, the popular movements in Colombia, were driven by and, and directed by CIA and by U.S. US policymakers, State Department, the U.S. Embassy here in, in Colombia. Uh, and it hasn't changed. So there was some optimism that because, okay, now we have suddenly we have a democratic administration that perhaps the human rights uh, um, uh, initiatives and demands that have been put forward by Colombian human rights leaders and organizers for years uh, will be taken seriously. There is a discourse of human rights protections. And in fact, Biden, during the height, height of the protest a few a couple of months ago, a few weeks, you know, about six weeks ago, actually publicly stated that we have to respect human rights, you have to respect the right for democratic uh, mobilization, et cetera. But on the other hand, he's having these kinds of conversations, full support, full uh, 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 you know, backing of the Colombian security forces in this in this process. Um, the good news is, and and this is where the pressure from U.S. Uh, the U.S. community, the U.S. public, has to come in because there was a, a, a measure by the uh, led by a number of Congress members, Jim McGovern, who's always been favorable towards human rights conditions on U.S. military aid. A measure that was passed just recently that pointed to uh, that that reduced 30 percent. Uh, or basically negated 30 percent of the military assistance to the national police, particularly the ASMAT, which is a, a kind of like a SWAT uh, a special rapid forces police unit that essentially is a military unit that's targeting civilians directly. In fact, the International Commission here that's uh, here on the ground right now for the next uh, couple of weeks, next week or so, that's what they're looking at, is looking at how the ASMAT security forces have been doing what they're doing with complete impunity. Um, as you pointed out, uh, 80 uh, people killed. If that, was happen if that happened in Iran, if that happened in Venezuela, that would be front page news every day in the United States. But here, uh, it, it happens and it's as if it's, you know, okay, that's just part of, you know, the situation in Colombia. There's nothing we can do about it. And uh, Mario, Colombia has also passed a grim milestone of uh, more than 100,000 COVID-19 deaths. South America as a whole has become a major uh, epicenter of the pandemic uh, uh, in the world. Could you, how, uh, how is the government dealing with, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic? The COVID-19 pandemic is a lot of people that we've been talking to and, 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 and it's been pointed out is really what led to the final explosion of, of, of social unrest. Again, this wasn't a spontaneous eruption. The, the, the protests that took place and that started on April 28th are part of a process that really started uh, back in November of 2019, and they continued moving forward. Uh, the COVID uh, pandemic, when it first hit in Colombia, obviously there was a major cl uh, uh, close down, everything was locked down. Public transportation was was stopped. Uh, people were essentially kept inside. Uh, and as it as it did in the United States, the the primary 
um, uh, kind of the people who suffered the most were people basically from the poor popular sectors in Colombia, right? Uh, the, the wealthy, the, the, the gente de bien, as they call them here, uh, the, the, they, they, they generally got out unscathed, whereas the masses of the people essentially lost everything and continue to lose everything. And I think what, by, the, by the time 2020 one came in and people were really tired. This is when the, 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 the protests came out. Uh, and, and right now, it's almost you walk through the streets of Bogota, it's just business as usual. I think the, the, the government has been reluctant to cl close down the economy again, even though right now, as we've been talking to people here on the ground, it's, it's, a, it's a second wave that is consistently staying at, at that level, 400 to 500 people dying a day, which if you translate that to the U.S. population, that's about three to 4,000 people dying every day in Colombia, as if nothing was happening. Maria, I wanted to go back to Father Javier Geraldo, the Jesuit priest and veteran human rights defender. Uno ve que se está asesinando, por ejemplo, a los, a los líderes de base, base. No a los We've seen that it is the grassroots leaders who are being assassinated, not union members from higher classes. But for instance, indigenous leaders, peasant leaders, the Colombian government is eliminating this kind of grassroots leadership. Most of the thousands of social leaders that have been assassinated since the signing of the peace accords have these characteristics. They are humble people who have a commitment to resistance and denunciation. So in this last minute we have, Mario, can you talk about how long the International Commission of Verification Investigation will take and where it's going? The, yeah, the International Commission, uh, there's about 40 people from representing 11 different countries all over Latin America, Europe, uh, Canada, U.S., Mexico. Uh, and the plan is to, well, the last few days have been meeting with uh, uh, human rights groups here in, in, in Bogota. Uh, meeting with uh, local activists as well as national level activists who are part of the movement, uh, student movements, uh, women movements, uh, the LGBTQ. And starting today, this afternoon, uh, all the groups are going to be breaking up into different regions, going to 11 different regions throughout the country where some of the most uh, violent uh, responses to the protests have taken place in Cali, in Cauca. Uh, in Medellin, uh, in the Caribbean coast, uh, in, in, and we're, I'm going to be heading to the uh, uh, coffee-growing region, to Pereira, and then later to um, um, Quindío. And we're going to be talking to frontline activists there. And these are the people who are being targeted. It's not an accident that they're being accused of terrorism, of vandalism, of causing violence, because that's been the discourse of the right for decades here in Colombia, any political social opposition against the economic political model of of intransigence, uh, of authoritarianism, of militarism, has been, has been silenced in that fashion. We have to leave it there, but we will continue to talk to you in Colombia. Mario Maria, award-winning journalist and professor at Hofstra University. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks for joining us.